last thing we saw there in verses 7, 8, and 9 was the marriage of the Lamb. And so uh, that suggested the purity of God's people, how they have maintained their purity through trials. They have not compromised their faith or given in to the enemy. And uh, we noted in verse 8 that uh, she is closed in the righteous acts of the saints. And uh, the section ended basically with verse 9, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper. Uh, So that's the celebration. Uh, The question is, what are they celebrating about? And that's what we're going to see in verses 11 through 21 this evening, uh, the victory, the, the, the warfare, the conflict, and its resolution. And so starting in verse 11, I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it is called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he judges and wages war. His eyes are a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems. And he has a name written on him, which no one knows except himself. He is clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. Uh, We'll stop right there for just a moment to notice a few things. Uh, The last scene that we saw in the chapter was the anticipation of the wedding feast. We saw that the bride has been prepared. Uh, The bride has made herself ready in verse 7. She is clothed in her finery, but we have yet to meet the bridegroom. And so while we are kind of expecting to see a picture of the bridegroom, what we see instead is this picture of a warrior riding on a white horse. And this is common, of course. We've seen this before in the book of Revelation. Remember back in chapter 5 that uh, the lion of the tribe of Judah was deemed worthy to open the seals of the book. And as we are waiting to see the lion, behold, the lamb appears. And so here is that same kind of shift in imagery that while we're waiting to see the bridegroom, we are introduced to the warrior. And of course, that's not uh, some kind of disconnect in the narrative. John is trying to tell us that these are the same character, that the character that is the bridegroom uh, in, and loves his bride and loves his church and his people and is eager to be with them is also the one who's going to fight for them. And he's going to defeat their enemy so that he can uh, have this relationship with his people in the end. Uh, Again, just like everything else in the book, there is Old Testament imagery abounding here. Uh, We hear this said of God in the Old Testament in Isaiah 42. The Lord will go forth like a warrior. He will arouse his zeal like a man of war. He will utter a shout. Yes, he will raise a war cry. He will prevail against his enemies. We get the same kind of thing said there in Psalm 78. And in that great uh, text about God judging the nations of the earth in Zephaniah 3, the Lord your God is in your midst a victorious warrior. He will exult over you with joy. He will be quiet in his love. He will rejoice over you with shouts of joy. So you see that idea of the warrior that loves the people of God is also uh, reflected in the text before us here. Uh, We're told his name, uh, Faithful and True, and so he is the image of what his people need to be. Uh, You get that in the book of Hebrews as well, that Jesus has been faithful to God and therefore has gone on to his reward And we are to follow him and be faithful as well. Same kind of thing here, uh, that he is the one that has been faithful to God. In all of the testing and trials that he went through, he did not give in, and he remained true. And so his people are bid to uh, look to him for their example. Uh, And he judges. Remember the word judges in the New Testament very often has the sense of condemns. And so he will condemn the enemies in righteousness and wage war against them. But perhaps the thing that is, uh, I think, the most interesting about this description there in verse 11 is that he is on a white horse. And if you were to say this uh, in the first century to the people of Asia Minor or just about anywhere else in that part of the world, uh, it would have been very clear what image you were conjuring up. 
and that would have been the image of a Roman triumphal procession. Uh, this was a very big deal to the Romans. Uh, when an, uh, a general would win a great victory, and there were certain criteria that he had to meet in order to celebrate one of these, but if he had a great victory that met all the criteria, he was given the honor of a public parade through Rome in which he and all of the prisoners of war, along with his army and the spoils of war that they had taken, were paraded through the streets of Rome for everybody to see. It really was a big deal. Uh, Roman records indicate that there were over 300 of these things celebrated throughout Roman history, and uh, as time goes on, they get just a little bit more extravagant and decadent uh, as they go. But one of the things that characterizes uh, a Roman triumph is that the triumphant general would either be riding a white horse or he would be in a chariot pulled by white horses. But everybody would have recognized in the ancient world that role of the white horse. Uh, also, when the uh, general paraded through the streets, he would wear crowns on his head, the victory crowns indicating, of course, that he had won a great contest. Uh, there would be a plaque with his name on it for everybody to see. Uh, there would be um, armies going along with him, and all of the imagery, of course, that goes along with this is uh, military in character. There are several of these things uh, in the ancient uh, Roman world. This is a triumphal arch, and there have been over a hundred of these things that have survived from ancient times. This one is in the city of Rome itself. It is the triumphal arch that was erected to the Roman general Titus for his successful campaign against the Jews in AD 70. So after he won the first Jewish war, the people of Rome gave him a triumphal celebration. Uh, this was built a couple years later, so this wasn't there when the celebration went on, but uh, later on in the time of Domitian, this arch was erected to commemorate uh, his brother Titus and the great victory that he had won. Uh, this is probably one of the more famous arches because on the inside of it is this scene depicting the looting of the Jerusalem temple. And so you can see here that the Roman soldiers are carrying the seven-branched lampstand uh, that they've taken from the temple, and this is the procession. They're carrying it through the streets of Rome here. Soldiers are also carrying a table from the temple. You can see that there are trumpets here, and there are plaques here that would have indicated what it is that you were seeing and the names of the generals and so forth. Uh, on the other side, uh, on the inside of the arch, is this representation, and this is Titus, and he is in a chariot here that is being pulled by these four horses, and they would have been white horses, and riding with him in the chariot is the goddess Victory. You can always tell her by the wings on her, and even though the monument is somewhat damaged, you can still see enough that she is placing a crown on his head uh, as he rides through this Victory celebration uh, and everybody is cheering him on as the great victor. Uh, interestingly, the younger brother of Titus, Domitian, uh, rode a white horse in this same procession. We know that from one of the things that were told by one of the Roman historians. And so that's kind of interesting that John mentions one riding a white horse here. Uh, and up here at the front of the procession, is this female figure here that is identified as the goddess Roma. Remember, she is the personification of Rome, and she is leading the chariot, as it were, through the streets to celebrate the great victory. Uh, all of that imagery of a victory procession is what we have here in Revelation 19, 11 through 14. Uh, you'll notice that he rides a white horse. Uh, he has, verse 12, many diadems. He has a name written on him, identifying who he is. He is clothed with a robe dipped in blood. Now, that would not have been part of a Roman procession, but uh, 
the general wearing his finest robes would have been part of this, but this one is a special robe. And then you'll notice in verse 14, the armies are following him on white horses, the armies of heaven clothed in fine linen, which is probably either a representation of the angelic army of God or maybe even the saints themselves as they are warriors in the army of God and here they are depicted as sharing in the triumph, also riding white horses uh, as part of this great celebration. Um, again, sometimes you will hear it argued that the book of Revelation is about the destruction of Jerusalem. Uh, it seems to me that when you look at a text like this, that there's no way that that kind of identification can stand. There is nothing in Jewish history like this. Uh, the closest you might ever come to something like this is when Judas Maccabeus wins the Maccabean revolt and takes the temple back from the Syrians, but there is no victory procession. There's a, a statement about how he was welcomed into Jerusalem, but this imagery is Roman, and it is clear that John is taking a swipe at the Romans here. Uh, notice some of the details, if you will, uh, verse 12, uh, his eyes are a flame of fire. You may remember that in chapter 1, that's how we were first introduced to him. His eyes were like a flame of fire. And so if we remember that description, there's our first clue as to who this is. This is the Lord. On his head are many diadems or crowns. Those are the crowns of victory. So he is one. Uh, he has a name written on him that nobody knows. Uh, there are a couple places in the Bible where we see this in Genesis 32. Remember, Jacob is wrestling with the angel. Jacob asked him and said, please tell me your name. And he, and he said to him, why is it that you ask my name? And he won't tell him. And similarly in Judges 13, uh, remember that uh, Manoah and his wife uh, have been uh, told that they're going to have a child Manoah says to the angel, what is your name? So that we may honor you when the time comes. The angel of the Lord said, why do you ask my name, seeing that it is wonderful? Uh, we might just want to mention here that there are s some people who have claimed that Jesus is this angel of the Lord. Uh, I don't think that is correct. And the reason for that is Hebrews chapter 1, where the author of the book of Hebrews makes it very clear that God has given Jesus a status that never ever belonged to any angel. And so even though it's tempting to see the Son of Man in the angel of the Lord, uh, it's not him. Uh, the, the fact that his name is mysterious means that he is connected with God. And that is the significance of it here as well, uh, that he has this name that is not just a human name. It is a, an, uh, a divine, a heavenly kind of name. And we have that same kind of thing said in the Gospel of Matthew. Jesus says in Matthew 11, All things have been handed over to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father. Nor does anyone know the Father except the Son and to whom he wishes to reveal him. And so this idea that Jesus is really only fully known by God and he is not really known completely by men, that is the idea that seems to be suggested here, that he has a name, but it's not any kind, this is not an earthly figure, this is not some kind of human general, this is a divine figure. Uh, he is also clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. Of course, if you've read anything else that John wrote, you know that that is one of John's terms for Jesus. Remember John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word. That is his designation for Jesus. And so to call him the word of God indicates, of course, that he is the communication of God, but also that he is the power of God, because God's word is powerful. 
And so he is the powerful word of God. He is the agent by which God accomplishes his will, and that is his role here as well. He is going to conquer this rebellious nation in the name of the kingdom of God. And then, of course, uh, verse 14, we have the armies clothed in fine linen, white and clean, which is just like the description we just saw back in verse 8 about the bride who is clothed in fine linen, bright and clean. And so it seems that the bride is the army and the groom is the warrior uh, in, in this kind of exchange of, of symbols here. If we were prone to still think that this kind of literature is written to hide things, that kind of falls apart right there because four times here we're told his name. Uh, John's really trying to help us identify him. All right, then, uh, verse 15, from his mouth comes a sharp sword. Uh, we saw that again in chapter 1 in our introductory vision of the Son of Man as he was walking uh, amid the lampstands, that uh, he had this sharp two-edged sword coming out of his mouth indicating the power of his word. Uh, but here it is not uh, directed at his people and his uh, judgment of them. Here it is directed against the nations. Uh, with this sword he may strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. And he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God the Almighty. Um, there's some familiar imagery here, of course. Uh, the sword is also the scepter. Uh, remember Psalm 2. We have gone back to that psalm numerous times. It is kind of the framework on which much of this story hangs, and such an important psalm for the early Christians, well, we have it here basically quoted in this text. And remember the psalm is about opposition to God and the Messiah on the part of the kings of the nations. There's an uproar, uh, and God says, I have installed my king on Mount Zion, and God says to him, Verse 9, that you shall break them, that is, break the nations with a rod of iron and shatter them like earthenware. Well, that's what we have here, ruling them with a rod of iron. And so this is the fulfillment of Psalm 2. Now, it's not the only fulfillment, but it is a big one. Uh, Psalm 2 is a paradigm that is fulfilled many times, but one of its greatest uh, fulfillments is in this conflict between Christians and Satan in the first century. Of course, its ultimate fulfillment will be when the Lord has conquered all at the day of judgment. But this is a significant fulfillment of it nonetheless. Uh, we're also told that he treads the winepress. That's an image that we have seen before in the book of Revelation a couple chapters ago. Remember that imagery of the, the wine of the wrath of God turned into the pressing of the wine and the grapes and the blood flowing and so forth. Well, we get that here again. Uh, Joel 3 is one of the sources of this. Put in the sickle, the harvest is ripe. Tread for the wine press is full, the vats overflow, their wickedness is great. And so, however you want to put it, he's going to put down the rebellion. He's going to reap the wickedness and the blood will flow uh, all of those images tend toward the same thing. Uh, it is an outpouring of the wrath of God, the Almighty. Uh, remember that Almighty uh, is an image from the Old Testament of God with his army, the Lord of hosts. And so in this text here where we have the King, Jesus, and his armies, it is not surprising that we should see that reference. Uh, Isaiah 63 is also part of this. We saw this before in the background of the other chapter, but uh, remember the text about the destruction of Edom. We have this one who is uh, come and his apparel is red, his garments are like those who are in the wine press, and the question is, why is your apparel red? And the answer the Lord gives is, I've trodden the wine trough. I trod them in my anger and trampled them in, in my wrath. Their life that is sprinkled on my garments. Well, that's what we have here. Verse 13, uh, his robe is dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And so by his powerful word, he is going to destroy the enemies 
and, and they will be no more. But not only that, in verse 16, uh, we have the third indication of his name. On his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Uh, ancient statues sometimes had inscriptions on the thigh uh, of the statue. I couldn't find a picture of any one of them uh, to show you, but you can take my word for it that, that that is true. And it is mentioned in the ancient literature that it was a common thing to do that. And so this was not unusual. It sounds strange to us, like a strange place to write a name, but uh, it would have been familiar to the ancients. But notice his name, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Uh, we heard that name before back in chapter 17 and verse 14, Lord of Lords and King of Kings. So here it's in the other direction here. Paul uses this same expression in 1 Timothy 6 and verse 15. Uh, it's actually a term that comes from the Old Testament. In Daniel chapter 2 and verse 37, Remember that uh, Nebuchadnezzar there has a dream and needs it to be interpreted. And Daniel uses this expression of the king of Babylon. Uh, you, O king, are the king of kings to whom the God of heaven has given the kingdom, the power, the strength, and the glory. Uh, the Babylonian king was called the king of kings because his kingdom was divided up into smaller kingdoms. And every one of those smaller kingdoms had a king, and so he was the king of those kings. And that is a, a term that gets used in the New Testament, of course, for the Messiah. But I think also here we have a, a hint at Rome. Now remember, whenever you see imagery of Babylon in the book of Revelation, that that's imagery of Rome for John. And just as the king of Babylon would have been called the king of kings, so the Roman emperors were known as those who ruled over other kings and other kingdoms. Uh, in his account of his life's accomplishments, the emperor Augustus bragged of having conquered over 50 different nations. And so even though he doesn't call himself king of kings in that text, that certainly is the impl implication. And sometimes, uh, if you look at inscriptions and things like that, uh, you will see the Roman emperors with a bunch of titles behind their names. Uh, for example, Trajan is called Germanicus, Dacicus, and Parthicus, which means that he conquered the Ger Germanic tribes, he conquered the Dacians, and he conquered the Parthians. And so whenever he would conquer a group of people, he would take their name as part of his title. And that certainly is in the background here as well, king of kings, lord of lords. The Roman emperors were the people in John's day who were claiming to be that. And of course, John's point is that all of this fanfare, the triumphal procession, the Roman emperor, being called Savior and God and Lord, being treated like a God and, and calling himself ruler of all the world, those are all descriptions that properly belong to Jesus. And John is saying, I'm showing you who the real emperor is here. Uh, that title also appears in biblical literature, Deuteronomy 10. The Lord your God is the God of gods, and the Lord of Lords, the great, the mighty, and the awesome God who does not show partiality. And that title is also used by Persian kings. It's used by the Greeks as well. It is a very common title in the ancient world. Everybody knew what it meant, and so John has said it really ultimately ap applies to the Messiah here. So here is part of the celebration. The first part of the chapter, verses 1 through 10, we saw the celebration, the hallelujah, the praise to God, the banquet, the marriage. We've been waiting to see what's happening. We've now seen a military procession. It's almost going kind of in backwards order, if you think about it. Because what you would normally do is fight the war first, then have the victory procession, and then have the party after that. But John has reversed it. It started with the celebration, then went to the victory procession, and so John says, 
Now let me tell you what all the celebration is about, and that in verses 17 through 21 uh, is the victory. So in verse 17, I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried out with a loud voice, saying to all the birds which fly in midheaven, Come, assemble for the great supper of God, so that you may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of commanders and the flesh of mighty men and the flesh of horses and of those who sit on them and the flesh of all men, both free men and slaves and small and great. So that's an invitation that you don't hear every day. Uh, there's going to be a great battle but it's going to result in a terrible carnage. And there's going to be a feasting on the dead for the birds of heaven. Now, what do you think that image is designed to convey? What's the point of that? Nobody there to bury them. Uh, in the Bible, if you don't get buried, what does that mean generally? It's a disgraceful thing not to be buried. Your, your body is treated like a piece of garbage left to rot. And um, are there any particular kinds of people who were treated that way in Roman times? Any particular people whose bodies were left to rot outside? Criminals, people who were crucified, were left on the cross, and the birds would come and eat their flesh, and wild animals would tear them down and so forth. Uh, it was considered a disgraceful, shameful thing uh, to have your body treated that way. It was, it was the Roman way of saying, this is what we think of you if you're going to act this way. And now those tables are turned. God in heaven says, I'm going to do that to Rome. I'm going to reject it the way that it has rejected uh, its... Uh, it's criminals. I'm going to treat them like garbage, just as they have treated other people. Uh, it is something that, of course, in the Roman way of thinking, was very common to do this to your worst enemy. God is using their own imagery against them, that they are going to be the ones on the receipt of this uh, humiliation this time. Uh, again, this is uh, Roman imagery here in verse 17. There is an angel standing in the sun. That's a strange thing to say, but again, uh, a Hellenistic audience would have picked right up on this. The person in the ancient world who is associated with the sun is the god Apollo. He is the god of the sun. And as we've noted on many occasions before, the Roman emperors associated themselves with Apollo. And so God is mocking their own exaltation of themselves. Here we have this angel standing in the sun, this great figure, and he does not announce Rome's greatness, he announces Rome's humiliation. Uh, there is a, there's going to be a great supper, and they're going to eat the flesh of kings and commanders, mighty men, horses, everybody, uh, probably representing here the vast extent of the Roman Empire. Uh, it's an interesting kind of picture. Uh, Ezekiel 39, 17 through 24 is kind of the background of this. You may recall that last time we looked at Isaiah 26 for a moment, in which God calls the Messianic age a great banquet. That it's going to be like a, a time of feasting when I gather my people together and they have the best of everything. Well, this is kind of the, the messianic banquet with a twist, as it were. Uh, Ezekiel 39, starting in verse 17, Speak to every kind of bird and to every kind of beast of the field. Assemble, come, gather from every side to my sacrifice, which I am going to sacrifice for you as a great sacrifice on the mountains of Israel, that you may eat flesh and drink blood. You will eat the flesh of mighty men, drink the blood of the princes of the earth, as though they were rams, lambs, goats, and bulls, all of them fatlings of Bashan. So you will eat fat until you are glutted, and drink blood until you are drunk from my sacrifice, which I have sacrificed for you. You will be glutted at my table with horses and charioteers, mighty men, and all the men of war, declares the Lord God. And I will set my glory among the nations, and all the nations will see my judgment, which I have executed 
and my hand which I have laid on them. And the house of Israel will know that I am their God from that day onward. The nations will know that the house of Israel went into exile for their iniquity because they acted treacherously against me, and I hid my face from them. According to their uncleanness and according to their transgressions, I dealt with them and I hid my face from them. That text is obviously the background of this one here. And the point is that there's not going to be any doubt when the smoke clears as to who is in charge of this world. Rome believed it was. The Roman emperors thought that they were the king of the world. Uh, John is using this Old Testament text to evoke to us the image that no, they're going to learn they're not. Uh, we, we hear this same kind of thing in David's taunt of Goliath, that I'm going to give your dead body to the birds of the air before this day is over. Uh, an utter defeat and humiliating destruction. And so the announcement of the battle has happened. Verse 19, I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and the armies assembled to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. And so here it comes. Here is the battle. And then verse 20, it's all over. Just like we saw back in chapter 16, Remember, there was that text there that we're anticipating the great battle of Armageddon. And verse uh, 16 of chapter 16, they're all gathered together at the place that is called in Hebrew, Armageddon. And so we expect now to see a depiction of the great battle, but the next thing we see is that it's all over and the city has fallen. Well, that's the very thing that we have here in chapter 19, that in verse 20, the beast is seized, he has been defeated, there is no description of the battle. Uh, Two things are significant about that. Uh, First of all, I think it speaks volumes against this modern-day speculation about some big battle at the end of time. Uh, We constantly hear in the religious world today about the great battle of Armageddon and how the Russians and the Chinese are going to fight the Israelis or something like that. And and there's going to be this big battle before Jesus comes. Well, if you pay attention carefully to the book of Revelation, that battle is never, ever described. It's never described. And so all of this attempts to to work out the details of the battle and the signals for it, seems to me is just not true to the text. Uh, Secondly, I think there's a reason why the battle isn't described. Uh, Can you think of what, why John wouldn't want to describe it? What would be the point of leaving it out? You know, there's no need to describe this battle because it's really over before it started. It's really not much of a contest at all, God versus these forces. Uh, Let me suggest another thing as well, uh, and that is that the battle's really not important. What's important is to know how it ends. What's important for these people to know is that God is going to win, and if you'll be on God's side, you'll be the victor. And there's really no need to dwell on the various aspects of the battle or how long it's going to take or anything like that. Because that's such a small part of this. Uh, The part that John wants them to concentrate on is the part that he has spent most of this chapter on, the first 16 verses, the celebration after it's all over. That's what I want you to think about, John says, about the victory you're going to have. And if we arm ourselves mentally with that picture of victory and reward, then the battle becomes a lot easier. Uh, We get this same kind of imagery in Zechariah. I will gather the nations, and then the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations as when he fights on a day of battle. That's kind of what we have here. God saying, come on, bring it. You know, you want to fight against me and my people? Come on, we'll settle this thing. Uh, Joel 3, I will gather all the nations, bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat, I will enter into judgment with them there on behalf of my people and my inheritance, Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations, and they have divided up my land. Uh, You really hear echoes of the Roman Empire later in that. They have persecuted God's people, and 
taken them prisoner and in vengeance for that God is going to uh, reap his wrath upon them. And again, of course, Psalm 2, 1 through 3 is in the background here as well. The kings of the earth have taken their stand together. They have lifted themselves up against the God and his anointed, saying, let us throw off his shackles and so forth. Uh, and God in heaven in verse 3 scoffs at them. It's one of the great, great pictures of the Old Testament. That here they are, they're going to fight against God. They're going to stage this rebellion, and, and we're not going to have God reign over us anymore. And it makes God laugh. The idea that man could do such a thing is just laughable. Uh, in Ezekiel 39, uh, in this very difficult text, otherwise we get the same kind of picture uh, God says, you will fall on the mountains of Israel, you, your troops, and the people who are with you. I will give you as food to every kind of predatory bird and beast of the field. You will fall in the open field, uh, and they will know that I am the Lord. And that's kind of the idea that's behind all of this as well, that when it's over, there will be no doubt as to who is in control. Uh, so then, verse 20, here's the way it ends. The beast was seized and with him the false prophet who performed the signs in his presence. Remember, that is the two beasts from Revelation 13. The beast would be the beast from the sea. The false prophet is the beast from the earth. And remember, he is also, we've identified him in chapter 13 as the emperor cult, uh, the religious side of all of this. He performs signs in his presence and deceives those who receive the mark. All of those are references to chapter 13. And uh, the point is that these great enemies, the beast and his minion, are seized and thrown alive into the lake of fire, which burns with brimstone. Uh, we've had a hint about that before, but here's another hint of it that this is, there's no way that they're going to recover, that God is going to decisively destroy this enemy, and it will not rear its head again. And verse 21, the rest were killed with the sword, which came from the mouth of him who sat on the horse, and all the birds were filled with their flesh. And so the promise, the invitation in verse 17 and 18 is fulfilled, a shattering, crushing victory, and that's why there is the great procession, and the celebration that we saw in the earlier parts of the chapter. Uh, and again, this language of everlasting destruction is based in Old Testament thought. Jeremiah 17, uh, You will let go of your inheritance that I gave you, and I will make you serve your enemies in the land. You have kindled a fire in my anger, which will burn forever. And then in Jeremiah 21, 12, O house of David, thus says the Lord, administer justice every morning that my wrath may not go forth like fire and burn with none to extinguish it because of the evil of their deeds. And so that brings us up to uh, chapter 20, which we're going to look at next time, which, in which we're going to see the lake of fire again, but this time in an even greater uh, scene of destruction. Uh, and there is a sense which chapter 20 is kind of the... The climax before the climax. I mean, the big bang on which the book ends is the description of heaven in chapters 21 and 22. And John wants to leave us with this beautiful picture of what stands in front of us so that we'll persevere. But he also wants us to understand and wanted them to understand that God is going to win. Now he's told us that over and over again. We have taken the approach to the book that we've been told the same story multiple times. But perhaps the most graphic telling of that story is the one we're going to find in chapter 20, and it is also the one that has, for some reason, caused the most speculation with the thousand years and all of that. So uh, we're going to look at chapter 20, Lord willing, next time uh, as the last kind of telling of the defeat. Well, our time is up. Thanks again for your good uh, attention as always.